Hello and good morning. Hello and good morning. I'm in a rough spot this morning because I have completely forgot the lesson I was going to teach you. So I was hoping you all would help me with it. I was going to talk about a guy named Jonah, but I can't remember some of the details. So I remember Jonah, he was going to go off to a city. Where was he supposed to go? God told him to go somewhere. It started with an N. Kind of a funny name. Yes. He was supposed to go to Ne. ne Nineveh. Nineveh. Okay, great. So, Jonah went to Nineveh, and is that the end of the story, or did he go somewhere else? He went somewhere else. Okay. So, when he decided to go somewhere else, did he jump in a pickup truck, or an airplane, or uh, one of them things that go on the water? One of them things that go on the water is a boat. <laughs> a boat. He jumped on a boat, and then there was a great storm. Right? <clears throat> so, what did those guys on that boat do? They threw, they threw um, boxes down, and then they threw Jonah. Okay, so then Jonah just swam away happily ever after? No! <laughs> well, what happened at that point? I mean, something had to happen. I was going to teach this lesson, and I forgot. I'm pretty well, sure I'm God, God sent a big fish. Or a big fish, big or Nevaeh said a whale? So what, what happened? Did he ride it out of there? No, it opened no, his mouth, and it ate him. It, it ate him. Like, say my arm is its mouth. It went in there, and then it's here. Right. Okay. He lived in there for three, di um, three days or four days. Or three days. Okay, three that days sounds, three days sounds three right. Days and what did Jonah do when he was in the belly of that critter? He prayed. He prayed, and he apologized to God, and he said he would do what God told him to, and then I guess the fish just continued to eat him, or what? what no, he spit him out. He spit him out. And then what happened? So he went on to somewhere. Where did he end up going? Nineveh. Nineveh. So he went to Nineveh like God told him to do. Well, that was the lesson that I was going to teach you, but apparently you taught it to me. <laughs> Does that sound right to you? All right, so we need to listen to God. And if we mess up, we need to pray. We need to apologize. But I'd say we better listen to God because I know I don't want to be eaten by no big old fish. Right? Let's pray real quick, guys, and you can be dismissed. Father God, thank you for these children. Thank you for faith like a child. Lord, help them to understand your words. Help them to grow in you. Help them to be the future of our church. Lord, forgive us where we failed you. Be with us for our day. In your matchless name we ask, amen. Amen. Good morning. Everyone get your hymn with turn number 41. Number 41 as we stand.
Remain standing for our opening prayer, Brother Gary. Amen. Be seated. Well, welcome everybody to November the 21st service. Twyla has asked me to announce that December the 19th we'll have our children's Christmas service. Have a little nativity there. Is there any new prayer requests that aren't in the bulletin that need to be added? Kenny Wilson. Okay. Terry New Family. Terry New Family. Linville Hughes is a little bit under the weather this morning. Be in prayer for him. Let's not forget tonight, 6 o'clock, our evening worship. Kids, youth, maybe a choir practice. Wednesday night, have Bible study, choir practice. Then our... Sunday, December the 12th, 5 p.m., our Thanksgiving Christmas dinner. Not going to be a service, just a good, fa old-fashioned Baptist feed. <clears throat> birthdays. Today is the 21st. Jesse Whitaker's birthday today. A few days ago, Vicki Hargis, Gianni Anderson, Kennedy Harris. Anniversaries. Gerald and Roxana Gerke on the 18th. Miranda Will Turner, the 17th. Jim and Jennifer Hughes will be next week. Any other announcements or a word from anyone? If not, turn your handles to 492. We gather together. <coughs> will come forward. We'll take up this morning's offering. <coughs> as 
bow our heads real quick. Father God, thank you for our day. Lord, we ask you to take these tithes and offerings, use them for whatever needs are here at the church. Lord, we ask that everything be given in love. It's all for your sake. In your name we pray. Amen. Martha's favorite song, number 318, Count Your Many Blessings.
there's no word from anyone else, and Brother Corey Hayes here with us today, I'd like to welcome him to the pulpit. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I don't think any of us have ever met before today. First question, is this my water? It is your water. All right, all right, we're getting along. <laughs> we're getting along good now. Uh, so Brother Jeff Griffin, I, I understand, um, suggested that uh, you guys call me uh, to be able to come and preach. And uh, I don't know if any of you have talked to Brother Jeff since then, but um, I appreciate Brother Jeff and, and his leadership in the church and uh, what he means to me and my family. Uh, former pastor of mine, just like he was yours, but uh, I don't know what you guys are used to as far as preaching style. Uh, I, I told you, some of you, that I come from the Taylor and Adair County side of Casey County and listening very attentively this morning, I, I don't think that we'll have to have an interpreter uh, <laughs> because you all know what Warsh means, right? All right, so we, we should be good there. Um, I usually don't preach too long, uh, but there, there was a pastor that, that came in one Sunday morning and, and the church found it rather odd that he, pre he preached eight minutes. And the, and the next Sunday he had come back and, and he, he preached 12 minutes. And uh, folks began to wonder, you know, the preacher usually preaches a little longer than that. But, uh, and this guy here was no exception to the rule. But he had preached eight minutes one Sunday, 12 minutes the next, and folks began to talk and wonder. And the third Sunday he came to church, he preached for three hours and 15 minutes. And uh, <laughs> finally, after some discussion amongst the congregation, the deacons all went up and, and clawed and scratched and finally got him to sit down and, and to hush. And they came to him and asked him, said, you know, we, we knew something was up the last two weeks, but we didn't want to point out the obvious. And he said, you know, I, ha I had some uh, problems. I had to go to the dentist and, uh, and I had my teeth pulled and, and I was using my false teeth that first time and my gums were real sore and he said I could only preach for eight minutes that's all I could stand and the next week my I was still sore my mouth was still sore and was only able to preach for another 12 you know for 12 minutes and he said I apologize this morning when I was getting ready I must have grabbed my wife's teeth <laughs> and put them in and that's what caused me to preach so long Thank goodness he didn't get his mother-in-law's teeth right. <laughs> so I said that to say this. We'll, we'll be between the eight minute and three hour mark this morning. How about that? Right? If you've got your Bible with you, turn with me to John chapter number eight, the book of John chapter eight. Very familiar scripture uh, that we'll be uh, reading this morning. Uh, a very familiar occurrence in, in the uh, life of Jesus and, and the life of others. Uh, and this morning's <clears throat> sermon is titled God's Writing. In, in Scripture, uh, after the service, if I'm wrong, somebody come and after the service, don't interrupt me. <laughs> Just kidding. After the service, if I'm wrong, you come, and, you come and, and help me out here. But in my search of Scripture, I find three places specifically where God writes. In Scripture, I find three occurrences specifically where God writes. Now, we all know that the Scripture, the Word of God is, is inspired by God, right? Written by man, inspired by God. But in Scripture, we can find three specific places where God writes. The first instance we find in Scripture of God specifically writing is in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, where, where God uh, penned the Ten Commandments. Exodus 31, 18 says, And he gave unto Moses when he had made an ending of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone, written with the finger of God. The second reference is found in the book of Daniel, chapter number five. Uh, remember in the book of Daniel, where uh, Daniel was brought in to interpret a, hand, a handwritten message uh, to King Belshazzar. And in verses uh, 24 and 25, of chapter 5 in the book of Daniel, we, we see the evidence where Scripture says, Then was the part of the hand sent from him, sent from God, and this writing was written. Verse 25, And this was the writing that was written, meaning, meaning, tickle you farson. So again, in the book of Daniel, you, you would recognize or, or you would see or 
it, it, it should be rather obvious to those uh, of us Bible readers that Daniel was brought in to interpret a, hand, a handwritten message from God to the king, and, and Daniel's story continues. Those are the first two instances of God writing specifically and are very familiar, to, again, to us Bible readers, the Ten Commandments and where the hand of God warned King Belshazzar are very familiar uh, passages of, of Scripture and are often readily identified when you ask, some, when you ask someone uh, to list examples of God writing. So, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, that's, that's an easy one, right? We, we all remember that God wrote the Ten Commandments. He gave it to Moses. Sometimes you see wheels turning and folks say, oh yeah, in, in Daniel's, uh, in the book of Daniel, we see the, the hand appear and, and the writing on the wall, and that's the hand of God in, in, in giving that message to King Belshazzar. And, and we have to go all the way to the book of John to find the third instance where I find God writing. So if, you, if you're there with me, let's read the first 11 verses. Scripture says, Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her, set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, and uh, excuse me, this they said, tempting him that they might have uh, to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So here God the Son stoops down and writes on the ground. This is the third instance in Scripture that I find where God specifically writes. Verse 7. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself he, and, and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And, and Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Would you bow with me, please? Father God, we come to you again today. God, we, we ask that uh, this morning, that God, that you visit with us for just a short spell. We ask that your spirit would, would come and dwell with us, God, and, and that your spirit would preach uh, to us the message that you would have us here. God, we, we pray that, that uh, we would be attentive, God, that, that, you would pre that you would prepare our hearts, that we would be open and, and, and ready to receive uh, the Word of God. God, this morning I pray that you would be with me, that I would stand, God, and declare the freedoms uh, that we find in Scripture, that, God, that you would uh, remove uh, the nerves, God, that you would remove uh, the, the, the worry, uh, God, that, that you would uh, allow me to stand here and be uh, just what I am, God, just a conduit for your Word. God, I pray that you would be with us. Bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. So, so here we are in, in, in John chapter 8. Again, the, the third place that I find in Scripture where God specifically writes. And this is probably, again, another very familiar passage of Scripture to you who read the Bible, to those who study the Bible, and to you that uh, look for interesting interactions in Scripture between Jesus Christ and others. <laughs> But to set the stage for the bulk of the message this morning, I would like to direct your attention to the first two verses. The first two verses of, of John chapter 8, it is, it is important to note the activity here of Christ and others before we get, uh, I guess, took off in this message. Scripture notes that it, it was early in the morning and, and Jesus had went to the temple. Uh, this is not something that we would consider uncommon for Jesus to do. There are several instances in Scripture uh, uh, in the Bible where we find Jesus visiting the temple. So this is nothing uncommon. This is nothing that is really earth-shattering. And, and also that he was teaching the people. So uh, in, in my mind, and, and 
in my way of trying to explain it, I guess, to myself, Jesus here is just being Jesus. Jesus is simply being who and what he was. He, he was a normal person. You know, granted, he was the son of God. Granted, he was God in the flesh. But Jesus was just as much a man as I am, right? He, he had those earthly tendencies. And, and so Jesus was uh, going about and being himself, being God in the flesh, being uh, about his ministry. And he goes to the temple. And, and one thing that, that uh, Jesus could do rather well that I have still yet to figure out how to do is Jesus could draw a crowd. Uh, folks were attracted to Christ. Folks were attracted to his ministry. Uh, I, I, would, I would speculate that Jesus was, was a good speaker. I would speculate that Jesus was a good teacher. And, and when Jesus would begin to speak and or teach, folks would want to come and listen. So in the first two verses, again, as we, as we, as we try to set the stage, uh, we, we notice in the first two verses uh, that Jesus is just being Jesus. Folks are just being folks. And, and you know, people are, are wanting to come and, and hear uh, Jesus teach. And, and you know, there, there may be those uh, first timers who were, this was the first time or opportunity that they got to hear Jesus speak. And, you know, there, there may have been those repeat offenders who, who had came back to, to uh, you know, hear Jesus uh, expound even further from the truth. But whatever and whoever they were, we, we see that Jesus, early in the morning, came to the temple. Jesus, just being Jesus, Jesus, he took advantage of the opportunity to teach. And people gathered around him, and Scripture says that uh, people came unto him. People gathered around him to hear uh, what he had to say. And I want you to notice in verse 2 how comfortable folks were with Christ and how comfortable... Uh, the setting was. Notice there, Scripture says, and he, speaking of Jesus, sat down. And he sat down and taught them. It's kind of like this setting here is, is what I imagine. You folks are comfortable. I don't see any of you on edge. You know, maybe here in you know, an hour and a half, you may get a little fidgety on me want to leave but right now everybody's calm everybody's cool everybody's collected right most of you are listening to me there, there's going to be you know three or four maybe half a dozen that take a nap between now and the time we leave but that's okay too everybody's calm right everybody's cool everybody's comfortable this is how i imagine verses one and two going down jesus went to church folks came and folks hearing him teach Everything's fine. Everything's fine, and you would imagine that folks are comfortable, they're attentive, and, and admiring of having Christ in their company until, until we have the inter exchange or the uh, interruption of the scribes and Pharisees beginning in verse 3. In verse 3 of chapter 8 of the book of John, the, the dynamic of the room changes. In, in verse 3, the, the setting changes changes the attitude changes in verse 3 we see the room completely change and we go from a comfortable setting uh, a comfortable setting one one of a setting of enjoyment a, a setting of, uh, of 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 education a, a setting of of jesus being jesus to a setting of chaos because the scribes and the Pharisees have busted in and, and they have drugged uh, this poor woman, whatever her name is. Scripture uh, doesn't identify her by name, but uh, uh, folks, the, 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 room, the room was just flipped upside down. Imagine with me uh, this setting uh, taking place today. Again, we're calm, cool, and collected. But let's just imagine somebody busting in and saying, preacher or, or, or deacon. Or, or church congregants. I, I, have a, I have an announcement to make and it's one that isn't real pleasant. I have an accusation to make and I, I want to make it here today. I want to accuse this or I want to accuse that. Just, just wonder with me or imagine with me, if you would, how taken aback you would be and how it would interrupt the service this morning. That's essentially what we experience here in, in the first three verses. So in verse 4 of John chapter 8, we, we, we hear an accusation. 
we, we hear an accusation from the scribes and the Pharisees when they declare, Master, this woman was taken or this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. That is a private sin that is broadcast publicly in front of literally God and everybody. You've heard that saying before, right? This, this private sin was, was broadcast in front of God and everybody in a public setting. Master, we've caught this woman in the very act. That's verse 4 and verse 5. We hear a question. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? Now, the law they are quoting is under the Mosaic law. Re let's reference Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, where the law says, this is what the law says. I'm not a lawyer, but this is what the law says. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife. That's how clear the law is. A man who commits adultery, even if it is his neighbor's wife, I don't care how close this woman is, if it's his neighbor's or if she's from faraway lands, it, it's funny how specific the law is on this. It doesn't matter who she is. Or if the roles were, were, are reversed, it doesn't matter who he is. Again, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. The man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That's the law. Again, I'm not a lawyer. But I will tell you something uh, about some folks that, that I grew up around. Uh, the, the lineage that I come from there's some hard-headed ones, and, and it kind of made its way to me. I'll argue with you. I really enjoy a good debate. I really enjoy an argument, if you will. But when the law is that clear, there's not, much, there's not much to argue there, is there? The law gets so specific, it, 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 it even references the neighbor's wife. Like, you know, that the neighbor's wife don't matter. She matters just as much as anyone else. The law says that the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. The law is very clear with what the penalty for this sin is. And when the scribes and the Pharisees come in, they ask, they ask Christ, what do you think? Moses in the law says this, but what do you think? In verse 6, the scripture is very clear with, the, with their, um, in verse 6, the, the scripture indicates a motive, an ulterior motive behind their questioning. Notice uh, the law is very clear, but what the penalty for this sin is, but however, in verse 6, there's a different motive. The Jewish leaders here, the Pharisees and the scribes, the Jewish leaders had already disregarded the law by arresting the woman without the man. They'd already made one mistake. The law requires both parties to be stoned. However, these leaders were trying to use the woman as a trap to trick Jesus. If Jesus had said that she shouldn't be executed, if Jesus had responded and said she shouldn't be executed, they would accuse him of violating the law. If, if he would have condemned her to be executed, then these Jewish leaders, these scribes and Pharisees would have immediately called for the Romans because during this time, the Romans uh, did not permit the Jews to carry out their own executions. So this woman that is brought in, this woman that is publicly embarrassed, this woman who is publicly shamed, this woman who is publicly accused of this private sin is, is merely being used as, by these Jewish leaders, as a trap for Jesus. Again, if he would have said, don't execute her, they would have said, ha ha, 
You don't believe the law. You don't trust the law. You don't think the law of God is important. If he would have said, execute her, they would have said, man, oh man, that's what we wanted you to do because here comes, <laughs> here comes the Romans and they're gonna put you in, they're gonna put you in your place. But notice with me in verse six, again, there about the middle of verse six, it says, scripture says that in Jesus's response, I love Jesus in this moment. Jesus' response to this uh, accusation is that he stooped down to the ground and with his finger he wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. Have you ever ignored anybody? See, husbands, I could call you out, but I'm not going to do that because I do that myself, right? And I'm in the pulpit and I've got to tell the truth. <laughs> but moms and dads, have you ever ignored cries from children? You know, mom, mom, dad, dad, mama, papa. Have you ever, you know, and it's obvious, it's painfully obvious what they're wanting. They're wanting, you know, you to help open this or you want you to do that or, you know, they're wanting to do this or do that. Jesus heard their question and Jesus knew their motive. But Jesus stooped down and he began to write on the ground. It becomes painfully obvious that this mob of do-gooders want an answer. In verse 7, we, we can almost see a frustration grow in their continual asking. Verse 7, again, Jesus stoops down and, and he begins to write on the ground as though he didn't even hear them. In verse 7, uh, Scripture says, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself. I can almost hear an elementary uh, style bullying chorus uh, start to ring out like, look, fellas, look, look, he, he don't know what to do uh, when we bring somebody like this in and we start to ask him these questions. Look, he, he doesn't know what to do. Uh, how about it, Jesus? Is, is this one uh, too hard for you? I can almost hear that chorus of bullying or that or that chorus of, of, of uh, disrespect. Now, now you're you're not so smart, are you? And a, and a merciful calmness when Jesus rises from his writings, he says, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now look, you remember back in verse two where, where we said that Jesus usually drew a crowd? It's because when Jesus spoke, it was the word of God. When Jesus spoke, it was, it mattered. When Jesus spoke, he was telling the truth. And here in verse, uh, verse seven, we, we see Jesus rise and answer their question with a question, really. He that is without sin, go ahead. For those of you who think you're worthy of judging this woman, go ahead, pull the trigger. For you who are without sin, you were the one that brought this woman to me. You were the one that came and interrupted our Bible study. You were the one that came and interrupted our prayer service. You were the one that came in and, and, and just wadded this whole thing up in a mess. For those of you who are without sin, if, if you want to accuse, that's fine, go ahead and accuse. If you want to condemn, that's fine, go ahead and condemn. But for those of you who are without sin, you go first. Jesus responds to their question and just as calmly as he stood up and just as calmly as he answered their question, I think the scripture says that he stoops back down or he bends back down almost to take himself out of the equation, almost to take his influence out of the equation because Jesus really wanted people to start standing in front of that spiritual mirror, which only, which only we can see, right? Jesus was wanting th those accusers to take a step back and say, you know, hold, hold your horses here just a minute, fellas. We really need to take an examination, self-examination. Look at yourself spiritually. So Jesus stoops back down and he continues to write. 
almost immediately. Just as the feel of the room was interrupted when this band of accusers busted in and interrupted earlier, I would speculate that their attitude began to change almost immediately. Now I'm sure many people have wondered and few have speculated what Jesus was writing when he was faced with the question he was asked. Many have wondered, I've wondered, many have speculated and I have a speculation that I'm going to share with you in just a, a moment but scripture doesn't record what Jesus was writing. He stands up and he answers the question. He stoops back down and he begins writing again. Maybe he was writing the Ten Commandments. Maybe he was writing, Thou shalt not. Thou shalt not. Maybe uh, Jesus noticed that the other party that the other party that is required in the act of adultery, maybe Jesus was writing his name because this fellow wasn't there. Had he escaped? Was he too quick for this band of do-gooders to catch? Or was he standing in their presence? Maybe Jesus was identifying the fellow they caught her with. And oh yeah, by the way, John Doe, or John Smith, or John Tucker, or whatever, you've been with her too. But you never were caught. Maybe Jesus was writing, um, I suppose he, he could have been writing, you know, what does the law say about this sin? Or what does the law say about that sin? Sins that they were guilty of and that hadn't been exposed. Scripture doesn't tell us what Jesus was writing. However, with, the, uh, with his response and, and uh, additionally to his writings, this woman's accusers began to leave. Scripture doesn't tell us what he was writing, but when Jesus stood and, and really put the ball in their court and said, you who are without sin, you're, you should be the first ones to cast the stone at her. See, that hit him right in the heart. Whatever Jesus was writing assisted that, that heart hit or that gut punch, if you will, from Christ to them. Whatever it was he was writing really counted. Because as soon as, as quickly as they came in, as, as quickly as they had drugged this poor woman in, whether she was handcuffed or hog tied or if she had came willingly, as quickly as they came in demanding answers. I think the oldest one in the bunch and looked my, he looked around very quickly. I said, fellas, I gotta go. I don't need to be here. We don't need to be doing this. I need to leave. Scripture says beginning at the eldest down to the youngest. It took a, took a while for us younger guys. It takes a while for us younger guys to learn, don't it? It takes a, a while for us younger guys to figure it out. These elders or these older men that, that are in the church, they know because they've been there and done that. The older ones was running with us young dogs that day. They were there too. The old fellows were running with us that day. I identify, I identify as a young person, by the way. But beginning at the oldest to the least, they began to walk off. One by one, they left the presence of Jesus and this lady until they had all gone. And I think it got quiet like it is now. You hear those footsteps fade. Jesus wasn't looking up and he wasn't. I, I don't think Jesus was looking up and was peering with a condescending stare. I don't think he had a mean scowl on his face. I think Jesus was paying attention to what he was writing. And you slowly hear those footsteps 
go away and it becomes quiet. Being accused of an intimate, private sin, this woman finds herself in an intimate, private setting with God. And God looks up and he says, Lady, I thought there were some folks that were here with you. Where, where did all those people go that accused you? Where did, where did these men go that said you had done wrong? Where, where did these men go that had said you had done bad? I see her kind of shrugging her shoulders and saying, I don't know where they went. Nobody is here accusing me now, Jesus. It's just me and you. And in a great act of mercy, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now I told you I was going to give you my speculation on what Jesus was writing. I think Jesus was writing a five letter word. I think I can't back this up with scripture but I think that Jesus was writing mercy. Webster's dictionary defines mercy as compassion shown especially to an offender. That's the definition of mercy. And, and that is exactly what uh, this woman experienced on that very day at that very hour. Instead of condemning that woman, Jesus taught us all a valuable lesson. Instead of judging her, uh, Jesus wrote. Instead of executing, executing her, uh, Jesus taught. He taught us that, that a merciful God is who and what we serve. In a world where everyone is quick to judge, in a world where everyone is quick to condemn and everyone is quick to ridicule and everyone uh, is, it seems like they, they are aggressive uh, to hold you accountable for mistakes, friend, our God is merciful. Listen, if that would have happened today, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, uh, Facebook, and all the other bandits that, that influence the, the news uh, media today, if that were to happen here at, what, what is this, Flat Lick Baptist Church, if that would have happened here today at Flat Lick Baptist Church, friend, the folks at WKYT and LEX would have broke their necks to get here to interview you and ask you what happened to broadcast all that bad news on the news channel today. But what Jesus teaches us in this moment is mercy. What Jesus shows us in this moment is mercy. What Jesus uh, shares with us in this moment is compassion. I'm going to ask you a question and I ask for crowd participation. Raise your hand if you want to be included. Who would like to come up here? Be careful. Who would like to come up here and confess in front of everyone all of their sins, both public and private? Don't, don't raise your hand at once because I can't keep up with who wants to come do that. How embarrassing would that be, right? Aren't you glad that you serve a God? Aren't you glad that you b believe? Aren't you glad that you trust a God who forgets. Friend, aren't you glad? Let me ask that question again. Those fellows that are in Sunday school, this is where I'm relying on you. Be a little rowdy here. Aren't you glad that you serve a God who forgives? Aren't you glad that you serve a God when He forgives? Friend, Scripture says that He forgets. Aren't you glad, friend, that, that God doesn't keep a tally or He doesn't keep a record of what you have done? What God is more concerned with is what you will be, friend. I, I am so thankful today that we serve a God that doesn't bring up the past. I am so thankful today that by mercy and through compassion and through that grace and through that salvation, the God that we serve today 
day, friend, look is looking for our future rather, rather than combing through our past. Saying, man, I can't trust you. Man, I can't trust you. I can't put any confidence in you. Look what you used to be. No time does Scripture record that Jesus stood up and told this woman how embarrassing. Because of your actions, you interrupted my Bible study. Because of what you were doing, you interrupted a prayer breakfast. Because of what you were doing, my cup of coffee is cold. John chapter 8, this exchange that Jesus had with this woman, he never did that, did he? He never judged her. As a matter of fact, Jesus shared with her salvation. I believe that woman got saved that day. I believe that woman got saved that day and she turned and faced the day and she turned and faced the community and she turned and faced her life and, and, and I believe and I hope uh, that that woman turned her uh, uh, life around. Think about how embarrassing it must have been for her to be caught in the very act and then to be publicly humiliated for her sin, brought in before God and everybody to be accused and then experience the mercy and forgiveness that only God can give. I often think about what happened to her the next day. I often wonder where she went who she became. Scripture doesn't follow her. And I don't think we see her anymore in Scripture. But I wonder where she went. Did she go home? Did she go home to her husband? Say, honey, I love you. I made a mistake. Forgive me. And I wonder if her and her husband lived a long and healthy life together. Maybe she wasn't married. Maybe she was sleeping around with a married man, right? Maybe she cleaned herself up. Maybe she cleaned herself up and she became marriage material. Maybe she met a young guy. Maybe she met a young preacher and turned into a preacher's wife. Maybe she started going to church and started teaching Sunday school. Maybe playing the piano. Maybe singing in the choir. I hope to find her in heaven one day. Say, sis, where did you go? What did you do? You know, I look back and I want to think she turned into a Sunday school teacher. I really do. Think about how many generations of folks that she could have influenced by sharing mercy and compassion with others. By teaching about a God she learned about. By sharing that, that message of mercy. By sharing that message of compassion. Did she become a mom? Did she become a, become a grandma? Maybe she became a counselor. Maybe she became a nurse or a teacher. But friend, one thing for sure, she became an example of someone who had made a mistake. She became a, an example of someone who trusted God. She, had, she has became an example uh, of someone who experienced mercy and forgiveness and shared, first, shared her story uh, firsthand with others and, and shared with me and shared with you and shared with others uh, how we can overcome our past and live a life that is pleasing to God. <clears throat> is that you this morning? Is there something in your past that you need to get over? Friend, I would encourage you, trust in Jesus. Trust in the mercy and compassion of God. And let God forgive you of that. See all that stuff behind me? It's all behind me. Friend, I, I, if life was a suitcase, I'd have 10 of them. But all that stuff's behind me. Let's look forward and serve a living God. Stand with us. Song leader, piano player, come. Bow with me if you would. God, we thank you today for what you've
what you have given us. We thank you today for your mercy and for your compassion. God, I ask that if anyone here today needs to experience that, that you would, you would stop by and visit with them. God, you would, you would stop by and visit. Peck them on the shoulder, God, with that grace and mercy and compassion. And, and allow them to find an altar of repentance somewhere. God, allow them to find an altar of encouragement somewhere. God, allow them the opportunity to, to go to maybe an offender. Or to an offendee, God, and, and tell them, hey, I forgive you. I'm sorry for what I did. Would you forgive me? God, if anyone needs you today, we pray that you would visit with them and that you would answer their prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 240. service. I know I enjoyed that. Amen. I was driving down the road this week and I saw on a church marquee up front said, the only one who was qualified to cast a stone did not. And so then I come to church this morning and I hear this message that really hit home. Any word from anyone before we go? I thank God for that mercy. Amen. No one else, Brother Ashley, take us home. Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful today that you love us, that you forgive us, that our sins are no longer seen but the blood of Christ, who paid the price in full. Thank you for that. We ask you to help us to live a life that we lift up and honor and glorify Jesus in all that we say and do. Watch over us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.